on the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. What's in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, it's a very interesting show for you today because we start off by going through various stories that ended up in my inbox whilst I was in the hospital. And then we conclude our happy and interesting discussion with Alison Jornlin about fairy folk. Enjoy. <laughs> I really like the old credits. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. Hang on. What's happening over there? Ken, what are we doing this week? Well, Barry, we are going to be ritually burning Hamble from play school. She was really gross, wasn't she? She was bloody awful. We're going to burn her good and proper. <laughs> we Let's start again. Good afternoon. My name's John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, which is, as I hope you all know, the largest, and we like to think the best, cryptozoological and mystery animal research group in the English-speaking world. And welcome to another episode of On The Track. For those of you who don't know what On The Track is, every Wednesday evening at 6.30 for about a quarter of an hour, and every Saturday afternoon at 3 for about twice that, we bring you a miscellany of hard science, weird shit, and surreality. What's surreality? Well, go and have a word with the dog. I've told you before, it's something stupid that Dad and Uncle Richard do, and I'm not going to tell you again. Well, in this episode, I want to talk about invasive species, which is a very much maligned and overused word, and quite often used in completely the wrong context. I want to give you a couple of examples of recent stories about alien animals, and I don't mean the sort of wander around going, I am your leader, take me to your leaders, beep, 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 I will exterminate. I don't want you to think I'm talking about that. I mean, alien as in from outside Britain. And I'm sure somebody is going to object to me saying that, but I don't really care. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is a European rhinoceros beetle which was found in Britain in February. It's a beautiful creature, and it's a great pity that they're not a British resident. It's native to continental Europe and widespread around the Mediterranean Sea. But it's been found in Durham, having hitched a ride in a potted plant. The charismatic beetle, which is measuring five centimetres, that's about two, two inches long, I think, was found in the soil of a fruit tree root purchased at a Tesco superstore in County Durham. It had originally been imported from the Netherlands. The European rhinoceros beetle is, according to buglife.org.uk, not thought to be a threat as an invasive species to the UK, although it does highlight a weakness in biosecurity. 
Now that story, the story about the European rhinoceros beetle, is a very interesting one. And did it make it into the national press? No, of course it didn't. But guess what did make it into the national press? Beginning of June, there was a story about how an Atlas moth, the world's largest moth, in fact, in one of the reports, it described it as the world's largest butterfly, which is completely um, untrue, and described as an extremely rare moth. Well, it's extremely rare in Swindon, which is where it was found in somebody's garden. That story made it into nearly all the national newspapers. So, if I can quote one of my mentors, the late, great Sir John Verney, let's unpack the case and look at the contents. There is an awful lot wrong with what has been written about this case. Firstly, and I didn't know this, so I apologise for having said this falsehood only a few seconds ago. It's not the biggest moth in the world. It is surpassed in size, in wingspan, by something called the White Witch and by a closely related species, Atticus Caesar, and in wing surface area by the Hercules moth, Cosinochera hercules. And as in most silk moths, females are noticeably larger and heavier than the males. And is it rare? Well, not except in Swindon. As far as I can tell, it is widely distributed and not particularly endangered anywhere. However, the big thing that this story doesn't bother to point out is they're available quite widely in Britain. Even we had them at the CFZ at one point. They originally come from a wide range of locations in Southeast Asia. And, as I said, they're quite easy to keep. From my memory, if it serves me well, which it quite often doesn't these days, we fed ours on privet, and we managed to rear them at least twice. The caterpillars eat readily, but they need to be kept indoors because they come from a moist, hot, tropical country. And even at the hottest of Britain, under its new regime of heat waves, can provide isn't hot enough to keep one of these things alive in the wild for more than a few days. This is a moot point because they don't live in the wild as adults for more than a few days. They don't eat as adults. They live quite a long time as spectacular large caterpillars. But as soon as they emerge from the cocoon, they only have a few jobs left. Job one, to find a mate. Job two, to copulate with that said mate. Job three, if you're a female, to go and lay the eggs. Job four, whatever happens, whichever sex you are, to die. I've always thought that they would be quite good pets to keep, to be able to teach the younger generation about the mysteries of life and death. But the chances of them ever becoming adapted to a British climate are absolutely non-existent for many years at least. Of course anthropogenic climate change is a thing and you'd be an idiot to deny it. And the climate in the United Kingdom, like everywhere else in the world, is changing. And in recent years the insect fauna of the United Kingdom has reflected that change massively. For example, the European swallowtail, a very beautiful butterfly, is now quite regularly found and even occasionally breeding in southern England. There are ant lions in two locations in East Anglia and probably elsewhere 
and we have several species of stick insect and at least one species of scorpion here now and I think all of that is absolutely fantastic but as far as silk moths are concerned I think the chances of us having any more than our one species of silk moth the emperor moth for the time being is very very slim but we started off with the European rhinoceros beetle. What are the chances that that could become established in Britain? Well, at the moment, still very slim, but with the way the climate is changing, there are all sorts of southern European species which one would expect are going to start moving northwards, and this could well be one of them. It all depends whether they arrive through a human vector in potted plants or whether they fly across the channel. Now regular viewers will remember that a couple of weeks ago we had Ronan Coughlin in the studio. Okay, he was actually in Northern Ireland via Zoom, but who's counting? And he was talking about one of his theories about the origin of the mermaid mythos. How does this tie in with this, the aquatic ape theory? It was, um, uh, yes, the aquatic ape. Somebody, and I can't remember her name. Yes, um, I've got her name down in the book there, but I won't go searching for it just now. Excellent. She actually got her theory from Sir Alistair Hardy, who produced it originally. But it is the theory that a, a certain amount of human evolution goes back, possibly to a pre-hominid that was in the water. Perhaps the whole human race has not descended from them, but some of them are. So she thought, and she adduces a great deal of evidence in favor of this. Because it's an unusual sort of theory, modern biologists tend to dismiss it out of hand. But I don't think you can dismiss something like that out of hand unless you get really strong evidence that it doesn't exist. Now, the other point is there is a problem with gills. I remember reading in one of these biological journals that underwater humans could not evolve because there is no, there are no gills in human DNA. I would say to that, that human DNA still contains many secrets and that the idea that humans cannot develop gills is contradicted in the standard official folklore book on the mermaids by Benwell and Wall. You possibly have a copy, a copy of it there. Because in the final chapter of that, it is said by the authors that one of them knew a woman who was actually born with a full set of gills and knew several others, or knew of several others rather, that had had to have vestigial gills removed after birth. So it seems that the facts would indicate that there is some sort of hiccup in the they can't exist because of DNA argument. While I was in the hospital, I found this on Quora. I'm going to read it fully for you because I think that the pictures that accompanied it are so much better than the ones we originally used to describe Ronan's theory about the fishy ancestors of mankind. This is an ear fistula, or much more elegantly and beautifully said, the preauricular sinus. It's a small hole at the top of the ear. One in every a hundred people has this small peculiarity which is sometimes associated with severe malfunctions of the middle ear and strangely enough with renal insufficiency. In Asia and Africa, the ear fistula is ten times more common than in our countries. 
However, in most cases it's harmless and occurs on both sides. However, it can become infected and must then be surgically removed. You might then mistake it for a pimple. But why do some people have this pimple? It's a connection between the surface of the skin and the mucosa of the middle ear, a second small ear entrance, so to speak, and it can occur when the first and second embryonic gill arteries, which give rise to the auditory bones in humans, are developmentally damaged. A preauricular sinus cannot develop within the course of ordinary life, but it can only be inherited. Now, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I had no idea that it was so common, and I had no idea that the gills of our ancestral embryos, if you like, the embryo which carries the DNA and some of the characteristics of our ancestors, were what turned into the bones that help with healing. Totally and utterly fascinating. Thank you very much to whoever it was who pointed that out to me. And now it's time to go back for the final part of our chat with Alison Jorlin about the fairy folk. I came, uh, home, I came home and told John all about it. I remember being pixie egg. I didn't remember the lights. That's tremendous. Yeah, that, that idea that they can uh, change your perception of reality mm. is just uh, astounding, but also very frightening. Um, and and you, you said that it was like walking through treacle. And um, so that's, we call that molasses over here. So, yeah. so you mean like, it was like trudging through molasses. Yeah. You felt like. It felt heavy. And yeah. Oh, a dreamlike, as if you yeah. were sleepwalking. And, and you went around and around and you yeah. couldn't find it. And uh, lots of people have stories like that of being fairy led. Uh, and uh, that I, I, that's amazing that you had that and you had some lights that you saw with it. Yeah. I, I know here uh, in the States, uh, one researcher uh, that we have, uh, John Tenney, he uh, told me about the experience of of seeing one of the fae and it was interesting he, he drew it on a napkin for me and it, it looked like a kind of a bipedal puppy dog <laughs> <laughs> so th they can appear in whatever guys they want to appear if, if they can make that gate uh vanish um and and lead people around like that uh you know what else can they make us see or not see one case that happened on my ninth birthday, 1979, in Rowley Regis in the Midlands in England, and the press called it the Mince Pie Martians. And there was this woman, it was shortly before Christmas, she was a woman called Mrs. Jean Hegley, and um, she was, uh, her husband had just gone out to work. It was about seven o'clock in the morning, and she was in her front room with a dog. And she heard this noise, looked out into the garden, saw what she described as a spaceship, but with like a scorpion tail on it. And these three or four little creatures came into the room and they were wearing like space helmets and they had weird waxy faces, but they were tiny and they had wings and they were flying around everywhere and they spoke to her and she offered them, they wouldn't take alcohol, but they drank water and they ate mince pies, hence why the press called them the mince pie Martians. And they were fascinated with her Christmas tree. But then when she lit a fag up, they were scared of the fire and uh and run away so why should a technological creature from outer space be scared of fire it doesn't make any sense right the thing is if you look at fairies in folklore they never have wings that was the invention of the victorians exasperated by the garbage of walt disney but because we think they have wings sometimes they appear to have wings these days but in actual folklore they don't they never yeah never do. i i agree with that interpretation although you you might want to read um uh, simon young's um uh, essay in here where he talks about walt disney and the possibility that he really was interested in fairies uh so that's 
an amazing uh, yeah, essay I've, that Simon I've, uh, I've, contributed. I've, I've spoken with Simon Young. I, I sent him my account. But uh, I've got a new book coming out very shortly called The Highest Strangeness, which is about high strangeness, 40 in cases in, in all areas of Fortiana. And there's a whole section on modern fairy law in it, modern fairy sightings, and their links with ufology. Oh, I can't wait to read that. And I, I think, you know, uh, the other uh, thing that might uh, be a similarity between um, between uh, my essay and your previous writing uh, is, um, you know, when you when you wrote that blog article on death by cryptid. Oh, uh, yeah. So so I there's seems to be some similarity in my essay um although i didn't refer to any of the cases in specific that you referred to i, I think you'll find um some commonality in looking into those mysterious uh, illnesses and death uh but um yeah i, I love uh hearing uh your account there's just um so many amazing stories of fairies e even even in uh, modern day, you know, you know, like you said, you had your your experience there. And um, I was speaking at a, a MUFON conference uh, a few years ago. And uh, after I got done with my presentation, you know, people come up to you and tell you their personal stories. And although I was um, presenting on um, airline safety issues, uh, <laughs> for some reason... I look like a safe person. <laughs> I try to be a safe person. Uh, and the, the guy came up to me and um, he told me, uh, you know, he had been a, a police officer and, um, you know, so he, you know, had a very responsible job. And um, he and his wife uh, both saw something very strange and he didn't, uh, he didn't classify it as a fairy, but he was coming to me uh, because he, he needed to know what this thing was. He said uh, that um, he and his wife uh, had been um, had been uh, in the bedroom, and it was um, they were working like different shifts. So, you know, they they would come in in the morning, and that would be their time to meet up and talk. And so, um, she was on one side of the bed, and he was on the other side of the bed. And uh, they're just discussing the kids and, you know, what the day holds. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the bed, on, the, you know, the, the side opposite them, um, they saw these little brown hands um, come up uh, and, um, you know, hold the mattress. And then this head peeped up and it was very, like, brown and hairy and uh, the... You know, they didn't see facial features because the brown hair was just covering everything. So so it just came up and and presumably looked at them, although they uh, the husband wasn't able to describe the eyes. And um, then um, it just sunk back down really quickly and they both freaked out. You know, they jumped up and they're like, what was that? And they're looking under the bed and all around and it's completely gone. And then the 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 wife recalled that when she was a child, about 10 years old, she uh, and her sister shared a room and uh, she and her sister actually shared a bed. And so they were sleeping in the bed together. And uh, the, um, the scary thing was that, uh, you know, uh, she felt something on the, on the bed and she just opened her eyes a little bit and she saw this, a uh, very small um hair hair uh like long haired man um and very brown in skin tone um climb up on the bed and uh climb over uh, her sister who was uh, presumably sleeping and then um and then uh, climb on top of her and uh, it was actually on her and so she she just like just pretended as if she was asleep too and um it it kind of uh went onto her stomach and curled up and <laughs> went to sleep and uh 
And at some point she did fall asleep as well. I don't know how that would be possible. But uh, she recalls seeing that same thing when she was 10 years old and then it reappeared much later in life. So people are walking around with these amazing stories, um, you know, and they, they, you know, they don't know what to do with them. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. I see we got a countdown oh. of four minutes, but I just want to... like a hobgoblin. There's a topic yeah. story called a hobgoblin that's supposed to live with families. And it would do chores around the house and you would leave out honey or milk for it or cream or butter. And they would stay with families for generations and they were supposed to be little hairy men. Yeah, um, I I did present that to them I, I when I looked into it. I said, it sounds like a brownie. Um, so, but it would be interesting, you know, that what you just said follows families to mm -hmm. see if she could go back uh, in her family tree and, and find out if there is that kind of relationship. But if, if the family moved, the hobgoblin would go with them. And right. If, and if it was disrespected in any way, it could cause chaos that sounds very like a poltergeist outbreak. Right. Yes, I've heard that, too. Uh, yeah, you don't want to leave out some new clothes for them. <laughs> and you don't want to overtly thank them or overtly put out the milk and the bread. Just, you know, <laughs> put it to the side like they just kind of found it. <laughs> Guys, we're, we're running. We're nearly out of time. We've got about a minute and a half left. But Alison will definitely, definitely do this again. Give me a couple. We'll do it again before the end of the month if we can. So Richard's still here. I want to try and work out a way that you, me, and Richard can all do Zoom together. That would be that would be great. The poor boy having to crawl across the floor like he's some sort of beast of the field. <laughs> but we'll. Uh, I promise we'll get back and do this. Do some more. I promise. Oh, I'd love that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, my dear. Well done. Thank you very much for all your kindness. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. But, of course, it didn't work out the way that we planned, as it so often doesn't. First of all, Richard's grandfather was taken ill, so Richard had to go post-haste up to the Midlands to look after the old boy. Then, whilst he was still in the Midlands, I get taken into the hospital, have my toe amputated and then by the time it's all beginning to come back to normal again, it's about a month later. But I promise you we will have Alison John and back on the show very soon because she is a mine of information and a mine of fascinating stories as well as being such a nice person. <laughs> If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, asks me to remind you all always press the notification bell otherwise you'll never find out when the next show is going to be and that would be an awful pity wouldn't it and that ladies and gentlemen is about it for this episode i hope you enjoyed it i'm going to be back next wednesday and next saturday with more shows but first i want to say a big thank you to the people but for whom I couldn't have done the show, my guests, Alison Jornlin and Richard Freeman and Ronan Coughlin. And I want to say a big, big thank you to Louis, my producer, but for whom the show would never get made, and to Graham, my carer and also the deputy director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, who looks after me admirably in a way that most people wouldn't have imagined. So, I'm going to be back on Wednesday. What am I going to be talking about? I have no idea. We'll get there when we get there. 
and I'll be back next Saturday. What am I going to be talking about? I have no idea, but are you ready, Mr. McCrillan? If you're there watching me and I'm going to be there in the live chat and everything like I always am. Oh.